Hey guys and gals, I'm Shane Stevenson, Director of Museum Collections and Curator here at the Buffalo Naval Park. Again, thanks for all of your support during the month of February. It's great to talk to you and to, quote, see you on a daily basis if you followed the channel through the whole days. Uh, for today's video, we're going back, though, to April of 1962. In April of 1962, you have USS Little Rock and you have USS uh, Galveston. And they are both in dry dock roughly around the same time. April of 1962. USS Little Rock is in Norfolk. USS Galveston is in uh, Philadelphia. And one of the things that they are doing is they are changing out their radars on the aft mast. Now, USS Little Rock is carrying the SPS-2. The USS Galveston is carrying the SPS-8 B. This video ultimately becomes a little bit about the SPS ANSPS 2. Now flash forward to September of 1963. The USS Oklahoma City is now in Long Beach Navy Shipyard. And what are they doing? One of the things is they are removing their SPS 8B radar from the aft mast and again, adding that SPS-30. Now, if you've seen an earlier video with a visitor uh, from History X, we actually go up to that platform, the SPS-30 platform. So, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show it from a little more stable positioning. All right, so while uh, for the first few years of each of the Talos missile cruisers uh, of this class, the Galveston class, the SPS-8B was carried on the Galveston in the Oklahoma City, while the USS Little Rock carried this monster, the SPS-2. Eventually, all three ships carried the SPS-30 for the rest of their careers. And the first thing that you'll notice is this huge diamond-shaped parabolic reflector screen. Now the SPS-2 was first envisioned as an offshore early warning detection system against ballistic and flat trajectory type missiles. It was later adjusted to include aircraft as well. The SPS-2 had a ceiling of about 90,000 feet and it was proposed because of the German a4 or V2 rocket, which was developed to have a hump or a double hump trajectory. So now you're not just having, like in World War II, you're having missiles that just, are, say, are flat to the surface of the Earth. Now, with ballistic missiles, they're launching into the atmosphere and creating that hump pattern and then coming down on top of the target. And the U.S. Navy had to try and solve that. This was a really heavy radar. It was 24 tons, and when you include all of its associated equipment, it took it up to about 40, 44 tons. And it was really only carried on two ships in U.S. Navy history. The USS Little Rock, and what is becoming one of my favorite ships, the USS Northampton uh, Command and Control Ship, CLC-1. So a little about the Northampton. She was an Oregon City class, CA-125. She was incomplete for World War II, but then she was commissioned on 7 March 1953, so 71 years ago just last week, and she served until 1970. So with the SPS-2, this system was made up of seven separate radars, or what we call beams. They were stacked on top of each other, and beam number one was the most horizontal to the ground, and also the farthest reaching. So she could extend out the farthest and then the six beams that were stacked on top created almost like a fan-like pattern that would be able to detect these ballistic and hump trajectory missiles. As I mentioned earlier, by 1963 the three Galveston class Talos missiles, uh, missile cruisers were all carrying the SPS-30. The SPS-30 was another height finder fighter radar. 
And now what that means is that it could detect targets in extremely heavy clutter and in a dense jammer condition. Because the Talos was the farthest reaching guided missile, it needed to have the best radar array. I covered that a little bit in a video in 29 and 29 talking about what ships were considered flagships and built as flagships and what were not. Alright, again now with the nuclear threat, ballistic missile threat, the U.S. Navy's policy was they spread the fleet out a little bit from their traditional a fleet arrangement in World War II. And when you're spreading the fleet out, you also want to have the flagship farther away from the rest of the fleet. So you needed the most up-to-date radar, and the SPS-30 had a range of about 240 or 250 miles. You put that in conjunction with the SPS-43 on the foremast, and now you're talking a range uh, circumference of about 300 miles of identifying friend or foe. So if the Oklahoma City and the Galveston is carrying the SPS-8B radar for the first few years, they chose the Little Rock as the experiment for the SPS-2. When that experiment was done, they then, again in 1962, took off the SPS-2 and added the SPS-30. So by 1963, all three are carrying the SPS-30 for the rest of their career. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. We want to thank you for all of your support during 29 and 29, and we will see you again soon.